Hi everybody and welcome back to this week's vlog. So this week I'm covering a really important subject and it's something we do see in GP often and as people get older it becomes more common and I'll explain in a minute. That subject is atrial fibrillation, otherwise known as AF for short. So I'll call it AF here otherwise I will trip up, you know me well enough. So what is AF? Well, it's a heart condition that causes an irregular heartbeat and quite often that irregular heartbeat is much too fast, much faster than a normal heart would beat and that's called fast AF. It's not always fast but it often is. It's most, the most commonly diagnosed heart arrhythmia and that's what we call heartbeats that are not going in the normal way. It increases the risk of stroke in the person that's got it by four to five times over the normal population. And most importantly, the complications that people seem to get from these strokes caused by AF seem to be much more severe. So it is a really important diagnosis to make and then treat. So who gets AF? 9% of people over the age of 65, so that's almost 1 in 10, that's a lot of people. And 2% of people under the age of 65. So as I said in the intro, as you get older, the chances of having AF, getting AF, go up. More women than men get AF, but that's probably because women live longer than men in the main. And so that skews the figures slightly because we see more AF as people get older and there are more older women than men. Less Afro-Caribbean people get AF compared to Europeans. So what are the symptoms of AF? How would you know that you had it? Well, the answer to that is not straightforward. In many people, they don't have any symptoms, so you wouldn't know if you have it. And it might just get picked up incidentally when your GP is listening to your heart for another reason. Or it might not get picked up at all. And the first time people know about AF is when they have a stroke. So if they do get symptoms, what are they? Well, the kind of things that you'd be looking for are palpitations when people feel their heart racing, they feel their heart beating in their neck, for example, they feel that their heart's fast, they get dizzy or short of breath or um, chest pain, and we'll come back to chest pain because obviously that's a really important sign, um, or they feel really tired. Quite often people who have AF describe a fatigue or tiredness. So those are the symptoms, so they could easily be confused with other things or there may be no symptoms whatsoever. So what are the risk factors for getting AF? What puts you more at risk of getting it? Well, as I've said, getting older, unfortunately, which you can't avoid. Um, high blood pressure, being overweight, being European, um, having heart failure or congenital heart disease. So a heart disease that you've been born with or if you've contracted a virus um, or bacteria in your childhood that's affected your heart. Um, pericarditis, which is an infection um, of the heart muscle around the heart. Um, atherosclerosis, which is um, plaques that form in your arteries that block them. Um, chronic kidney disease, heavy alcohol use, Cardiomyopathy, and this is where chambers of the heart are enlarged, and ischemic heart disease. So heart disease where you don't have enough oxygen flowing to your heart, probably caused by atherosclerosis. So those are the risk factors. But AF can also be associated with other things. So pneumonia, for example, and when I had pneumonia early on in the year, I did have arrhythmias of my heart. So it can definitely be associated with a heavy infection like pneumonia. Asthma, um, diabetes, any lung disease or lung cancer. So COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a disease of smokers in the main. Hypothyroidism, when your thyroid is working too well and putting out too much thyroxine, thyroid hormone, or you have an underactive thyroid and you're taking too much thyroxine to replace it. Having a pulmonary embolism puts you at risk and also having carbon monoxide poisoning which obviously is rare but those are the things that are associated with AF. 
So what are the triggers? And there are some very clear triggers. So drinking too much caffeine, and that's in coffee, tea, um, caffeinated drinks, like alcohol, um, drugs such as amphetamines or cocaine, and smoking. So those are the things that can actually trigger an episode of AF. And you can actually have AF all of the time, so your heart is always in that rhythm, or some of the time, so it goes in and out, and that's called paroxysmal AF. It doesn't matter which one you have, they both need to be treated and both in the same way, and both can have that devastating end effect of a stroke. Paroxysmal AF is obviously slightly harder to diagnose because it's not always there, but we'll talk about that. So how do we diagnose? Well, obviously you'd go to your GP, but the first thing I want to say is I mentioned chest pain. If you have chest pain at any point, you go to A&E because if there's a risk that it might be your heart and that's why you've got chest pain, you need to be in A&E where they can treat you. But thereafter, if you feel anything that's changed in your heart rhythm, if you have palpitations, if you think your heart is racing, um, take your pulse. And I'm going to put links afterwards to two brilliant sites. One on the British Heart Foundation, which tells you how to take your pulse, but also shows you some sound bites of what a normal heart should sound and feel like uh, that you can have a look at. And they're quite fun, so that's why I'm putting that one there. And also a link to the Arrhythmia Alliance, which also has a nice um, way of taking your pulse. But essentially, you would have your wrist, I don't know if you can see this, bent at the wrist, two fingers in the other hand, not your thumb, and you press it about here, and you'll be able to feel your pulse. And that's your heart beating. And you just count it. And it actually should be quite regularly. And a normal heart should be between 60 and 100 beats at rest. So if you're just running on the treadmill, don't take your pulse at that point. Um, anything that you feel is irregular. So if it's all over the place, the beats are not coming regularly with the same kind of gap in between. And it might just change slightly when you breathe in and out, but not much. Um, if you think it's beating too fast, if you think that it's missing beats, go and see your GP. Anything you're worried about. It's not gonna do any harm if you're wrong, but it could do lots of good if you're right. So you see your GP um, when you've got any of these things going on. And even if your heart is consistently below 60 or above 100 at rest, see them as well. And the ECG may um, do an ECG there and then in the GP surgery. But if they don't have that facility, they usually have a walk-in facility. So I can send people to the local hospital for a walk-in ECG. And that's an electrical recording of your heart activity. And that's where they just put the stickers on your chest and um, record what your heart's doing. Um, they might refer you to a cardiologist, either urgently or non-urgently, depending on what's going on. Or they might even start some treatment after taking advice from someone. But certainly see your GP. So what are the treatments for AF? Well, as with everything, there's different solutions. So there's medical tablets, um, either to control the risk of stroke, to stop you having a stroke or try and minimise the risk um, or to control the atrial fibrillation. There's cardioversion, which we're going to talk about later, to get your heart back into a normal rhythm. There's catheter ablation, again, to try and restore the normal rhythm to your heart. And there's a pacemaker. So those are really the five treatment arms for AF. The treatment considerations will depend on how old you are, what type of AF you have, what your overall health is like, because that's important, what symptoms you have, and what the underlying cause is. And that's quite important as well, because the first thing anyone will do when you've got a diagnosis of AF is try and find the underlying cause. Because if it's infection, if you've got pneumonia, and that's why it's happening, we need to sort that infection out, treat the infection, and hopefully the AF will go away. If it's hypothyroidism, we need to treat that, whether it's treating your thyroid to um, reverse that overactivity or whether it's reducing your dose of thyroxine. So it really does depend on what the cause is as to what the first course of action is. But thereafter, we've got those other arms of treatment that I discussed. So let's look at the medicines. So the medicine aim is to control, um, control the rate and restore it to normal. 
um, and as I mentioned, to um, minimise the risk of stroke. So to restore your heart to normal rhythm, there are several drugs that we can use. There's a drug called flecainide, um, there's a beta blocker, amiodarone and dronadrone. I think I pronounced that right, dronadrone. And if we want to control the rate, not just get the heart back to northern rhythm, normal rhythm, so if it's going too fast and we want to slow it down, we've got beta blockers like bisoprolol and atenolol, calcium channel blockers like verapamil and diltiazem, we've got digoxin, and we've got sometimes amiodarone that we use for both rate and rhythm. So are there any side effects of those medications? Well, I'm afraid the answer is obviously yes, because there are always side effects to medications. But the side effects are far less damaging than having a stroke, which can be devastating and change life forever. So beta blockers can give you cold extremities, so cold hands and feet. They can actually cause nightmares, lower your blood pressure, um, cause impotence in men, so inability to get an erection, and they can cause fatigue. Um, Fleconide can cause nausea and vomiting and actually paradoxically can cause heart arrhythmias. But then that's often the case, you know, an anti-epileptic drug can cause epilepsy and so on. Amiodarone um, can cause light sensitivity, so you, well it does cause light sensitivity, so you can never not wear um, a factor 50 sunscreen and cover up with clothes, you can't go in sunlight. It can cause liver and thyroid dysfunction, so it's important that those are monitored. It can cause lung problems and it can actually cause deposits in the eyes but these are reversible when you stop taking it. And verapamil can cause low blood pressure, constipation and ankle swelling. So those are the side effects of the main drugs that we use to control the rate and rhythm in AF. What about the drugs that we use for reducing stroke or the risk of stroke? So it's really important that we try and stop clots forming in the heart and that's what happens in AF. Because of the way the heart is beating, the upper chamber, the atrium, can actually get big and a little bit saggy and so as it doesn't beat properly, blood just congeals in there and forms a clot and if that passes into the ventricle it can then be thrown off to the brain and that's where it causes a blockage and a stroke. So it's really important to try and stop that happening. Um, we do a risk calculation, essentially, and we take into account things like age, sex, um, not whether you're having it, but whether you're a man or a woman, um, have you got heart failure, diabetes, um, any valve problems, um, hypertension. And on that basis, we decide whether or not you also, alongside the other medication, need a drug to reduce your risk of clotting. And the drugs we use are warfarin, which you've probably heard of, lots and lots of people on warfarin. But you do have to have regular blood tests on warfarin to check that your levels are in the right range so that you're not bleeding too much or too little. Then there are newer anticoagulant drugs, um, sometimes called NOAX or DOAX, and these are digger Gigabatrin, trying to trip me up again, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban and Edoxaban. And Edoxaban is used for people who have got heart disease, um, coronary um, artery disease and have more than one risk factor. All of these are licensed by NICE for AF and NICE says that you should have the choice of what anticoagulant you would like to go on. And there are pros and cons of both. Warfarin, for example, is quickly reversible if you need to reverse it, whereas the newer anticoagulants are not so quickly reversible. But the newer anticoagulants don't need regular blood tests. So it's pros and cons and what suits your lifestyle. We do know that the newer anticoagulant drugs are as effective as warfarin for preventing um, strokes. So if the drugs aren't working or if for some reason they're um, is opportunity to use a different version. We have cardioversion. And cardioversion is a controlled electric shock to the heart to shock it back into its normal rhythm. If you've had AF for more than two days and you're going to have cardioversion, there's more of a risk of you making a clot. So you would probably go on to anticoagulants for three to four weeks before having the cardioversion. If it's an emergency, we can do some imaging of the heart to actually see if there are any clots there before we then do the cardioversion. So it can be done in an emergency. 
If it's successful, you may or may not still need to take anticoagulants for life, and that really does depend on whether or not you're high risk for the AF returning and whether you're a high risk for stroke. Catheter ablation is another method of treating AF. So basically the catheters are very thin soft wires that are guided um, through a vein into the heart. They measure the electrical activity that's going on there and they try and find the area that's actually causing the problem. So the electrical, electrical activity that's going wrong essentially and causing the heart to beat in this weird and wonderful way. Once they've actually found that area, um, they use a high frequency radio wave to generate heat and burn the tissue away. So you remove those cells that are not behaving well and hopefully that corrects the arrhythmia in the heart. It can take up to two to three hours to actually complete this and so you probably have a general anaesthetic so you don't know about it and you wake up and everything's okay. It is actually a very quick recovery when you wake up, but you shouldn't do any heavy lifting for two weeks and you shouldn't drive for two days. And then finally, we've got a pacemaker. Now a pacemaker is normally used when somebody's heart is beating too slowly to make it beat quicker or if it's dropping beats, but it can be used in AF and it's implanted just under the skin, just under the collarbone here. And it may be you know, what you need to help your heart just beat regularly and in the right rhythm. It's a minor procedure under local. They are battery operated and they're tested every um, so often to make sure they're working properly. And we tend to use these in people who are 80 years old or over or those that have failed all of the other treatments. So, as I've said, the risks of having AF long term are stroke and heart failure. Because if your heart is actually beating in this irregular way, and I mentioned to you that the, the top chamber, the atrium, can get saggy and the muscle can lose its tone, then that can actually lead to heart failure. So this is a really important condition that we want to get on top of quickly. So as I've said, take your pulse regularly at home. It's like checking your breasts regularly, ladies. You know, we, we try and get you into that habit. Check your pulse regularly and just make sure you know what the pattern is and what it's doing. Any major change at all or anything that you feel is wrong isn't the way that it should be beating. See your GP. Any irregular heartbeat, see your GP urgently. And see the links that I'm going to put in the guidance for you on how to take your pulse and what it should sound and feel like. And hopefully I've given you a whistle-stop tour of quite a complicated um, condition and that's allowed you to at least be aware of it and to get used to your own heartbeat and should you need to see a GP quickly you'll go and do that and I'll say one more person from having a stroke and that would be fabulous so I hope it's really helped um, any questions just pop them in the um, comments afterwards and I'll always answer them and any suggestions for future um, vlogs please let me know and I will always do them and I always try and do them reasonably quickly Thanks as always for watching, it's much appreciated and I really, really am grateful for your support. Have a happy Easter. By the time you watch this, it'll be Easter Sunday and you'll be up to here with chocolate, but I hope it's a happy one.